Welcome to our very last Inspired By of this season. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. I'm Nancy Turrell. I'm the Executive Director of the Arts Council, and I'm just super glad that you're here tonight. I think you're in for a really special treat. Everybody you talk to tomorrow and over the weekends can be really jealous that they weren't here tonight. So be sure you rub that in. <laughs> Some of you have heard this story before, but I think it bears repeating. We created this series about two years ago as part of our cultural conversations in order to share an intimate glimpse of what inspires our artists in any medium to do what they do. We've modeled our inspired by after television shows like Inside the Actor's Studio and Spectacle with Elvis, Elvis Costello. Tonight is our biggest inspired by ever, so thanks for being a part of that. Uh, it's a really a, just a perfect fit for our mission, which is to inspire participation in and a passion for the arts. Our efforts in cultural conversations really had a big expansion this year. We received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to bring creative programming into the lives of students in our community with a focus on those who were between 7th and 12th grade. The balance of the series was sponsored by Wilmington Trust and Women Supporting the Arts so that we could have great creative minds share their insights, thoughts, and passions with our arts patrons. The season included Andrew Cato from the Maltz Jupiter Theater, Stuart Robertson from the Atlantic Classical Orchestra, and Lacey Davison Doyle, who was referred to us by the Society of Four Arts in Palm Beach County, who helped us better understand how to look at contemporary art. So I want to spend a moment here to thank Wilmington Trust and Ms. Debbie Owens, who's one of our board members and sponsors, and she's right back there. And then Women Supporting the Arts is a women's donor circle that's a fund within our Arts Foundation of Martin County, and several of the Women Supporting the Arts members are here tonight, and I invite them to stand as well. Without the financial support and sponsorship, none of these programs would be available, so thank you very much. Hopefully you've had a chance to meet a few of our board members who are working the Arts Council information table. Thank you, Neil and Mary Ann, for working back there tonight. Membership, which is one of the things they were talking about, is really, which is really just an annual gift to the Arts Council, is a core part of the income that supports our programs in the community. Private support of the Arts Council, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, is the lifeblood of our organization. With funds that people like you generously contribute, we can do really great things. This year marks our 35th year serving the community, and we will begin a long-range planning process this summer to take us to 2020 and our 40th anniversary. Already, we are contemplating a performance event like the one we did for our 30th anniversary entitled Dreams. If you have any ideas and suggestions, please let me know. Our planning will start in earnest in mid-June. Next year is going to bring about some new programming, including some new partnerships with performing arts groups. Already in the works, thanks to the volunteer commitment from our board member, Marie Jury at Beamish, will be a monthly series in the gallery called Sunset Concerts at the Gallery. It will showcase some of the extremely talented young people in our midst in an intimate recital space, allowing us to blend performing and visual arts together in a single night. We expect this to debut in October. And speaking of the fall, the Martys are returning and will be bigger and better than ever. There are nomination forms at the table in the lobby, and we encourage everyone to nominate an artist, student or adult, who is both exceptionally talented artistically, but is also engaged in their community, sharing their talents to improve our world. The deadline for nominations is right around the corner, May 30th. More details about the event will be rela released later this summer. And now, without further ado, it's time to begin our program. I'm going to welcome two individuals onto the stage with me, both of whom have long legacies of support for the Arts Council. The first is our facilitator and interviewer for tonight's Inspired By, Samia Ferraro. As a side note, Samu actually is the board chair who hired me to work for the Arts Council. <laughs> Sammy served as board chair of the Arts Council in the late 1990s and has remained very active as a volunteer member and supporter ever since. And then my second introduction of the night, who's going to make the final introduction of the night, I have enlisted the help of Mr. Tom Postopnik to introduce our guest artist. Tom taught our guest artist, Tony DiTrelizzi, in both middle and high school, and was, 
and Tom was on the founding board of directors 35 years ago of the organization that eventually became the Arts Council. So, and he's never once for one minute stopped being a volunteer. He currently serves on the gallery committee and his baby is the Marvin S. Cohn High School Juried Art Show that's currently hanging in the Courthouse Cultural Gallery right now. So Tom, it's my pleasure to let you introduce Tony. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I know all my friends are out there. I can't see a, a single thing, but I know you're out there. Um, I've known Tony for about 35 years. Um, I was a teacher at Murray Middle School and when he first joined us in sixth grade. I had him for three years there. We did a lot of different interesting things. And then about the same year that I went to South Fork High School, Tony went to South Fork, and I had him for four more years in drawing, drafting, and just hanging out. Uh, when the time came for him to go to college, um, I made some suggestions, and uh, uh, Samuel mentioned a little more about that. Uh, but I have known him again since um, for the last 35 years. I got a, a couple of little goodies here I wanted to show you. I've been traveling a little bit, so when I do, I try to look for Tony's books. This one came from Italy. The whole book's in Italian, and it's one of these books that pops up and folds out and does all kinds of interesting things. You know you've really made it. <laughs> you share, share a box with Ronald McDonald and Tony Dieterlisi, how can you go wrong? Uh -oh. Reese's Puffs. Tony Dieterlisi Reese's Puffs box. How can you go wrong? <laughs> and that's all I want to say. My good friend, Tony Dieterlisi. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You guys paid money to see me? I've been doing it wrong for so many years. What a beautiful audience. I'm I can't excited. really see you, but I think you're beautiful. <laughs> I'm actually Tony's dad. Tony, Tony couldn't be here. This is old dude is his dad. Is this your mom? That's my mom. My mom's here. So I'm Hi, Mom. Worried. How are you? Could you stand up and turn around and let us applaud you? <laughs> you are beautiful. What is your name? Carol. Carol. So nice to meet you. I'm Sammy. Come on up, Mom. You just do the rest. I'm going to sit down there. If you no, 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 no. You're on the spot today. Um, <laughs> clap for me. How many of you are from Jensen Beach High School? Whoa. Nice. Hi. How many of you are from Martin County High School? Yay. Woo nice. <laughs> and how many from South Fork? Oh, All right. Nice. All yeah. right. Anyone here from Murray Middle? Right? Wow. And I doubt this, but anyone from Hope Sound Elementary? Whoa! Nice. Wow. Look at that. Tony is an alum of all of those local places. That's why this, this is so exciting for me. I'm, I was, you know, I didn't really know much about Tony because I was one of the older people. <laughs> but I have learned an awful lot about him um, just for this evening. And one you did of the, your book report. Huh? I did. I did. I did a lot of work. I did a lot of research. Luckily, we have this guy, Google, that really helped me a lot. <laughs> I don't know what I do without Google nowadays. But the one thing that I found, well, I found a lot of things, obviously. But one of the things that I found that was so interesting to me is that you have, I guess what I would call a personal philosophy. A motto that you live your life by. I do. Tell I, us about that, especially for these young people in the audience. My motto is never abandon imagination. That is, I have had that as Say like it a, again. Say it again. So, <laughs> slower? Slower. <laughs> never, no. Never <laughs> abandon imagination. Okay. Yes, that's my motto. I've had it for a long time. I, um, I think it came to me um, probably like my later years in high school when I started to feel the, the, the weight of cynicism and, and the reality of the world that was coming 
careening towards me as I was going to leave high school and all the stuff, the imaginative stuff that I loved as a kid, the fairy tales, the games, the movies, all the things that, that made me so happy. And I think um, it would be so easy to let that stuff go and just immerse yourself in the real world and, you know, and, and what we see in the news every day and the realities that we're all faced with. And, and I just dug my claws into that piece of my, my past that I love so much. And I realized, and I saw some of my friends let it go. And I, and I thought, I'm, I can't let this, this is like, this is like, uh, this is like the little fire that's inside of me. It's been burning there since I was a little See, kid. See, I think that's great. I Thank you. That, Good night. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you got you. Yeah, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> Um, I want to start way, way back in the beginning. Well, almost back in the beginning. I want to start with, first of all, tell us about growing up with Carol and the rest of your family. Because then the reason I'm asking this question is because Tony's a writer, Tony is an artist, and I think a lot of those things come from home. They absolutely so tell, tell come from home. Tell us about your, did your mom read to you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She read, I'm the oldest of three. Um, so, uh, did your dad read to you, or is it mom? No, mom. My <laughs> mom. mom stayed home. She okay. was a stay-at-home mom. She stayed home with uh, all three of us kids. And it wasn't until my youngest brother was in um, high school, probably by the time you know, he was almost out. He was out of high school before you took a, took a job. No, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> this it all. This is how he remembers things. This is it. I'm just this. This is making up. This is how we do it. We're we, I'm weaving a tale right yeah. now. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I, I grew up, we grew up off of County Line Road, and we were, we are literally the southernmost part of Martin County. Huh? Like, you throw the ball and it rolls across the street, you're in Palm Beach County. <laughs> so, um, we would be having this uh, somewhere in Palm Beach Gardens, no, probably. I'm glad we're here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we, we stayed home. I, 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 my mom was very crafty, very artsy. Um, she painted all the time. She drew. Uh, she made dolls. She, she, oh, oh, there was always a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And we had, my, you know, my dad worked at Pratt & Whitney, which I'm sure a lot of people can, can relate. Your dad's uh, an engineer? My dad's an engineer, yeah. So you've right, got, that's different. Yeah, so you've got, <laughs> yeah. you've got the artsy on one side, and you've got like this analytical on yeah. the other side. And, um, and so we, um, we, we had a nice life growing up down there. And, and I, um, I was the kid who caught a lot of bugs. I was a kid who loved to fish and, and snorkel, and I read a lot. My mom read a lot to us, and it was, it was an amazing... Stop right there. Okay. Okay, all I'm you done. kids out there. I used to be a teacher. He read, okay? Oh, yeah. That's, that's my four-letter word. He read a lot, and look how famous he is now. Okay? <laughs> Keep reading. <laughs> my mom read a lot, and, and the thing is, and I, I have this memory still, is uh, my mom was reading me House at Pooh Corner, A.A. A. Milne. And I remember very distinctly her reading and laughing at stuff in the book, and I didn't know what she was laughing at. And I thought that was really fascinating that a book that was made for kids would make a grown-up also, in, like the grown-up would get some kind of enjoyment out of it in a way that's different than a kid would. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and that, that went through all through grade school. It, it evolved into... Um, reading other books. So many times it would form a dialogue between mom and I. So I, it went on to like, okay, I read The Hobbit, then she read The Hobbit, and then we read all the Piers Anthony Xanth books. And we would have this amazing connection during a time in my life when a lot of boys, uh, maybe girls too, weren't having a connection with their parents. They were more interested in other things. And, and that reading those things always tethered us in a really nice way. We always had some place that we could, we could come to and, and, and talk about stuff. Wow, that's great. I remember yeah. my boys growing up, I don't think they came out of their room for the four years they were in high school. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was in my room a lot, too. I, I read to them, too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was a good mother. <laughs> I promise. Well, I don't know. Tell us, Sandra. Yeah, no. <laughs> I promise. How, how was it um, growing up? What were your boys like? Tell, tell, me, tell me what you were like as a student. I mean, for example, how would the other kids in the school have described you? What, what, uh, what years? Am I in grade middle school? school? Middle school. Middle school. Wow. High, middle school, high school. So you can I, was, remember. I was in Murray Mental School in, um, 
1980 through 83, it was an amazing time when I think back about it in pop culture. Rubik's Cube, MTV, Network Starts, Music Videos, Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, there was amazing stuff. It was probably the worst time of my life uh, personally, because it's middle school. I mean, it's, yeah. it's middle school. There were, you know, I was, I still look like I was nine. And there'd be dudes at school that are like, hey, what's up? They'd have the beard and the mustache already. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, hi. You know, I mean, I was, I was this nerdy. In fact, okay, so I'm going to some schools uh, tomorrow. We're going to talk to some middle school kids. And I, I have a box of, of crap from, from when I was a kid. And I went through it and I found, sorry about that. I found my glasses, because I want you guys to really get a sense of what, it, what I would look like in middle school. Wait for it. It's really worth it. <laughs> Line up, ladies. There's a lot here, a lot, a lot in here. I'm guessing you didn't sit at the cool lunch table. No, no. <laughs> sit at the, you know, went to your character's arm class table. That was, that was, that was, that was me. And I, I, you know, I had, I had a good group of friends. You know, it, it is one of those things as you go into high school, you know, your, your friends that you had in, in elementary school, sometimes they move on. Sometimes you get new friends. Um, you know, I survived. You know, I, I you know, did my thing. You did thing. okay. I did okay. <laughs> it's, it's a tough it's tough when you're, um, when you're not cool. Because I, I felt like so much of, especially going into high school, was about being cool and, and, and fitting in. And, 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 and I feel like um, I didn't, I would have given anything to have that. And there were times in my life I felt like I lost a little bit of myself trying to chase that. And the reality was I just needed to just hold on to being who I was. It sounds cheesy now. No, but no, 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 no. I, it's, I it's hear about you. the oh, that's getting a slow clap. Sit down, John. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You were you were an artist this in, is in your middle life. school, an artist in high school. Yeah. And Mr. Prostopnik Tom over there. Yes. It, it, the two Toms. He, now he keeps saying, I know Tony Dieter Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> and but it it seems as though he was almost a mentor to you in school. Would you, would you describe them that, your relationship that way? Yeah, I mean, definitely, um, you know, I, when I, I've been to a lot of uh, schools all over the country when, I, when I'm on book tour, uh, Samia, and, and when I go to an elementary school and I ask who here likes to write and who here likes to draw, all the kids' hands, ah, I love to write, I love to draw. Go to a middle school, about half the hands. When you go to high school, it's like two weird dudes and an art chick. <laughs> And that's it. That's who raised that was you. Hand. And I was one of them. And it's like. <laughs> so a lot of people could draw really. There were a lot of kids that could draw, you know, growing up. And, uh, and so now when people are like, oh, you know, I, I feel like you're so lucky. You got this thing you can do. You can draw. You come up with stories. And, and when I think back, but there was a lot of kids that could do that. I'm really fortunate, I think, that I had. Um, my, my parents to encourage me, but on top of that, it was extended into uh, middle school in the art program mm -hmm. and, and reinforced in high school with uh, Tom Wetzel in, in those art programs. And, and for those uh, teachers, public school teachers, right, they get paid nothing to see like a kid and a, and a sea of kids and they're, they're trying to like, hey, maybe this kid's got a chance and, and if we just do a little extra thing for this kid, man. You know, who knows what, that, what they'll do with their life. And, and, and both uh, Mr. Prostopnik and Mr. Wetzel were incredibly instrumental in, in, in keeping me on the tracks. Because as I said, I would have done anything to be, be cool. I really, that really had a big impact on me well, in I high school. I think it does most kids. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, and it's hard. It's really hard. It is, but look where you are. <laughs> so that's why I want you to A hundred years watch. later, you yeah. too. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you graduated from high school, and then? I went to um, the armpit of Florida, Palatka, or as they call it, Palatka. Is anyone here from Palatka? So I don't, before I start to offend the town, I, I <laughs> you can throw your food at me now. Um, there was a, there's a state school up there, which was a great school, actually, Florida School of the Arts. 
It was a great school. It was like fame. There were kids that like, I dance. There was a kid that was like, I act and you know, I paint. Yeah. And, and I went to school. I got accepted actually in Ringling, um, which I was incredibly Really like amazing. About. I know. Yeah. yeah. But no money. You know, I mean, that there's, there's it is kind of the reality of, of my, my life and my childhood, and, and I don't think it, it'll ever end, is what you, what you dream for and what you want to grab and then the reality that's facing you and what you can realistically do with your life. And so as much as I was proud and excited that I got accepted into a school like Ringling, there was no way we could pay for it, even with the scholarships I got. It just wasn't gonna happen. So the Florida School of the Arts was within reach. And, um, and I went there and I wasn't really ready to go to school when I think back on it now. I, um, I knew how to draw. Like I said, a lot of kids could draw, and I think, I think a lot of it had gotten, I just thought, oh, this is a thing I do, and I can do this, and I can always do this. And I got there, and um, it was 45 minutes away from the University of Florida, from Gainesville, which a lot of my classmates had gone to, which if anyone has graduated or visited friends there, they know that as soon as you walk there, you can smell the stale beer and the party, exactly. the rolling wind <laughs> of partiness that just comes your way. And, I, uh, and that's what I did. I, I was completely reckless and, and irresponsible. I partied too hard. I, um, <laughs> I can't believe my... Mom, do okay. you know all this? <laughs> I'll tell you. My mom knows this story. My mom knows this story, but not a lot of other people know this story. So I lived with this, this roommate, and, and the teachers knew I had talent, right? But they... Um, and they were frustrated with me, the, the professors there. We had this roommate. We would literally, it's like college. You go home and you're eating the mac and cheese in the box. And we had this roommate who's like, I'm eating steak. And we're like, steak? Like, dude, how do you have steak? Well, I go to Publix and I just get the steak. And we're all like, you know, porn. He's like, so he was total like klepto. He would just go and just, oh. he would just, he was just, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going there. Um, Took a while. <laughs> So yada, 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 then we're all in jail. <laughs> Spent a week in jail. I didn't want jail. you to talk about this part. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Just yada, yada. <laughs> and, then, and yada, yada, yada. yada. <laughs> you know, it, the, I, yeah, I got, it, was, it wasn't anything bad, like really bad, but it was enough to jolt. I got so, like, I felt like I disappointed my parents. I disappointed those instructors. Um, who believed in me at that school. And I remember for a summer, I just stopped drawing. Like, I just didn't draw. I, I'm a kid who's drawn every day, like every day. When the teacher was talking in class, I'm drawing. You know, it was like Charlie Brown's teacher, walk, 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 walk. And I'm like, just drawing, drawing. And a lot of times, though, it helped me process. It helped me understand. I would draw when I was upset. I would draw when I was happy. I, would, I mean, I drew all the time, and I just stopped after this. I think because I was so disgusted with myself, to be honest, and disappointed. And I, um, it, I almost had to have the thing I love almost taken away from me, like self-destruct it, in order for me to understand how special it was, that I was really fortunate that I, I could do this thing, that I could see things in my brain and I was learning how to like, get them out of my imagination in words and pictures. And I, I came home, I, I went to um, uh, Palm Beach Community College, and it was like, I was like a four-star student, or a 4.0 student all the way to the undergraduate. Like, it was like this incredible turn, which is why I bring it up, because I yeah. really, I, sometimes you almost have to go to the brink to understand how good you have it, or what you ha even have. And I don't think I knew what I had. I really didn't until I went through that. And it took years for me to get, to get my feet back under me. But when I think back on that now, an incredible, pivotal point in my life, it really, really was. And, um, and, and it just, I, I set a new course and just never, never veered off of it. Then you ended up at the Art Institute in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Graduated. Yeah. Like I said, like top of my class. Yeah. Four, like it, went, it was a 180 degree. But you're an artist. But I'm. You're an artist at this yeah. point, right? You're a, you're a graphic designer. I got you're my an degree. Artist. I got my degree in graphic design because I, I 
I didn't think I could make it as an illustrator, okay. and I thought graphic oh, okay. design, designing logos and letterheads, I thought, well, that's a real, that's a sensible, I could get a job doing that. I don't know if I could get a job illustrating uh, down here in South Florida. This is pre-internet, right? So how would I even find work? So how did the illustration come about? How, how, did, how did you make it work? I, um, well, I had, I had a couple things. The, the, the interesting thing is when you're a kid who likes to draw, and, you're, and I drew a lot of the same stuff that I draw now, like bugs and dragons and monsters. So you, I had to figure out how to corral that into something. Mm -hmm. and, you, and art school helps a lot with that, because if, if you like to draw, but you don't quite know where to channel it, it'll help you open doors and see like the applications. You know, well, maybe you can design creatures for a video game. Maybe you can work in movies. Maybe you can work at, you know what I mean? Like there's all these different things that you might find your place. And I still loved books so much. And when I would draw a character that I was coming up with, there was always like a story that would start around it. I would draw this character. I, made, I always made sound effects. Mom always told me when I would draw, I'd be like, because <laughs> it was always, it was, it was always a, a moment in a, in a, a story that was un, unspooling in my brain. It was never a static image. It was always a, 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 just a clip of something. And that turned into drawing and then writing around the drawing. This is this character. They do this. They did that. They went here. They saw this. This is in the land of this. This is the bad guy. And it, and it keeps, and that's, that's still how I work to this so, day. Okay, so see, I, I didn't get that when I first read. Because <laughs> that was the secret. I, that was it. That's you it. Were, you know now. You, Ill, you drew and told this story at the same time. So that's how you become a writer and an illustrator. Yeah, yeah. See, that really impressed me that you did both. There's, Why, thank you. This, well, <laughs> sure. New York Times bestseller, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and if we didn't, you would remind us, right? <laughs> New York, I'm a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's, there's kids who come out of this theater, kids who work with Jennifer and Peter Jones. And my husband, I'm sure he got this term somewhere, but he calls these kids triple threats. Because okay. they can sing, they can act, they can dance. All the same kid. They okay. can do all of those. They're amazing. Yeah. And the same thing here, where you've got this uncanny talent yeah. to tell stories and illustrate them. Your illustrations are kind of different. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this fantasy thing you do. Wait, how does that, how does that face go when you say to <laughs> um, I told you I was very conventional. Um, I, 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 um, I, I think because I was a nerd, I, I identified with some of the more grotesque things in the world. I liked insects because sometimes I felt like I was an insect. I liked monsters because sometimes I felt like I was a monster. And so that is the stuff that also um, interested me and excited me. And, um, and, and I, I sought it out in books, in films, like movies like The Dark Crystal or, or Labyrinth um, or the, the, the Cantina Aliens in Star Wars. I don't um, think I saw any of those. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, it's diversity. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even know. Um, and so I, I, I think those types of things, because they excited me so much, I wanted to be able to draw those, those types of things. For me, fantasy and, and, and creatures and monsters and these, these things have always been a language of, of they, they, they symbolize me processing things in the real world. They're all just characters symbolizing things that are going on in my, in my real world. So for instance, um, a, a, in Kenny and the Dragon, which is a middle grade book that retells the reluctant dragon. Um, I am, you know, I'm both of those characters. I'm this little rabbit who's bookish and the, he thinks the other kids don't understand him, but I'm also this dragon that is also completely misunderstood. This, this beast from a long time ago that, that no one wants around, 
because I felt many times because I liked things like, like, like fairy tales, and 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 I'm an adult, and I'm still. I mean, I was definitely like. I remember reading my brother um, Alice in Wonderland, and and I was in I was in high school. He would have been in like elementary school, and then I like was still. I wanted to read it again. I'm, I'm bringing like Alice in Wonderland to high school and reading it. No, not, not you don't cool. do that. You not don't cool. do that. <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, so that's that's me being okay. that old ancient yeah. dragon holding on to these things. There's a see. See, it's just a yeah. it's just a circle. It's just me. Pro I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm just going to process. Where do you fit? Where do you fit in? Because I never felt like I ever really fit in. I never felt like I fit in in Florida. I never felt like I fit in in, um, in New York City. Um, I don't even know if I feel like I fit in where I live in Massachusetts. I think it's just trying to find a, a place where I feel like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. That's, that's what all these are. That's me kind of searching for that. I think a lot of people feel the same way. Yeah, I agree. Sure. <laughs> and now the Q and A period will begin. Go ahead. No, I am curious though. How were you academically in school? Um, in yeah. in I, like in high school and grade school, yeah. Yeah. I was good up until about high school, and then I was not so good. I you know because um, I, I I think there was a lot of things going on. I think I could have been a better student if I had applied myself. Um, <laughs> But, but that thank, attitude, thank you for that. That, that, that jokey, jerky attitude, I did that a lot. Because I like, oh, people, oh, you guys like that when I'm, when I'm like that? So then I would be like that. So the teacher would be like, walk, 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 walk. And I'm like, hey, blah, 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 blah. you know? Oh, my God, a girl is smiling at me. I'm going to just keep doing this now, right? Oh, you know, I can draw. I can, yeah, eh, you know? So I think there was a lot of that that was going on, trying to fit in, trying to be accepted. Um, um, and then, you know, but I also feel like near the end of my high school, uh, I, by senior year I had done, I remember I had done a lot of classes that I, that I needed to graduate and I had openings to take art classes and I took, I just piled on all the art classes, I took tons of art classes and I really felt at home there, I really felt great then. So, um, I hope that answers your question. I was, I was okay, but could have been better. But in art, you know. You know, we were talking earlier about some of your creative, some of your creative inspiration, people who inspired you, like you're inspiring all of them. And I, I had told you that I had read to my children um, uh, Where the Wild Things Are, Maurice Sendak. Maurice Sendak. And, and I did, and I wasn't exaggerating when I said I must have read that book two or three hundred times yeah. because they wanted to read the same book over. You all, some those of you who have children, yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. But tell us how that inspired. I mean, that's a, an amazing book. Yeah, Maurice also I think dealt with a lot of. Um, he was trying to process stuff in his books. I think a lot when you look at him now, um, and where the wild things are. My take always was that it was a kid who just wanted a timeout. He needed a timeout. We just didn't have that word in 1967 right. when it was published. But he was, he was wound up. He's, Max is having a, you know, it's, it's the witching hour. He's totally just being a brat, and he needs to go away and, and process. And then he figures out, uh, he cools his jets. He's done being a wild thing, being the king of the wild. I'm such a wild thing. I'm going to be the king of the wild yeah. thing. That's what kind of wild thing I'm going to be. And then he's like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go back. And he goes back and, you know, his food's there. His mom still loves him. That's an amazing, yeah. that's a powerful thing. That you, no matter how angry and upset you get, I still love you as your parent. Powerful stuff. That's real. That's, and you're reading that at a point in a child's development when that stuff's being hardwired into their brain, right? That's the, to me, that's the real magic of a really well-crafted book. A lot of people don't like wild things, and I think that's fair. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's, it's also kind of creepy. And, you know, if you look at it superficially, there's a lot of hairy dudes just <laughs> running around with no pants on. And, you know, <laughs> I get it. I get it. But, um, I you wanted, know, a, a I lot wanted of, to read you this quote. If I can, now I can't find it, of course. You look. I'll keep babbling. Uh, you keep talking while I look. Well, Morris this. was a huge influence. I like Dr. Seuss. We grew up on a lot of Dr. Seuss, but it was really the later Dr. Seuss stuff that really has stuck with me, the Lorax especially. I think living here in Florida and reading the Lorax now, you're like, oh, dude, he is just writing that about Florida. Like, that just <laughs> really, really uh, strikes a lot. 
And then there were other inventive people, like Jim Henson was a tremendous influence on me. Oh. In fact, one of the reasons I moved to New York was to try to work for Jim Henson, and um, it just never worked out. He had just recently had passed away by the time we moved to New York City, and they didn't know, they didn't know what they were doing. You know, they were like, they were like sheep without a shepherd, you know, with, with Jim gone. And I've gotten to know a lot of those folks, and they're wonderful people, but um, it, I, that Henson DNA is in all my work. I think you can see it, the, the, my love of the Muppets and, and the movies that Jim created. Mm -hmm. So and they seem to come out together. It doesn't seem to be illustrations and then writing, no, or writing and then illustrations. No. It seems to happen as a single Same process. Time. Yeah. But each it, book's a little different. But yeah, for the most part, yes. Yeah. And then yeah. interesting, because you can take a classic poem, okay. like The Spider and the Fly, and you can illustrate it without telling, I mean, with the story that's already been told. Yeah. And then. And I want, to, I want to hear more about this in a moment. But you could also take the art that came from Star Wars right. and write a story. Yeah. So yeah. you can do all, it. I mean, do you see that how, it, that's interesting. They're like puzzles yeah. to me. Yeah. They're like puzzles. I think with Spider and the Fly, I, I'm. And you won an award for that. I, I wanted did. to point that out to everyone. I won. I won a, a <laughs> an fancy, amazing award. A fancy pants sticker for yeah. that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's a big deal. We all buy books with the Cal is it Caldecott. Caldecott. Named after Thank Randolph you. Caldecott, the illustrator. Um, I, um, that, that book, if there's anyone that's like a big bibliophile, I was not supposed to be the artist to illustrate The Spider and the Fly. It was supposed to go to, um, oh, my brain's synapsing here. Um, he did Puss in Boots. I can't believe I'm blanking Somebody on this. Else. Somebody else. Somebody, yes, yeah. yes. It was another illustrator, and he had passed away on, in an untimely fashion. Wow. And, um, and they were looking for another artist to do it. And my editor had seen a cover I'd done to Cricket Magazine that had a bunch of bugs. And we're like, Tony, Tony can draw bugs. I'm like, I'm from Florida. Of course I can draw bugs. <laughs> yeah. it's, all, it's old people, bugs, and lizards. That's all there is here. <laughs> <laughs> and palm trees. And palm, and well, palm, trees. palm trees, yeah. Good. So um, that, with that, it was... They faxed the poem, right? And the poem's coming out of the fact. All I knew was the first stanza. Where you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. I didn't know the rest of it. And it's coming out, and I'm reading it as it's coming out. I remember this. This is the fax mime. And it's real jerky. And it gets to the end. These kids don't know about fax. And the spider, you know, and the spider eats, spoiler alert, the spider eats the fly. And I'm waiting for the next page to come out. And that's it. And I, I'm like, where's the rest? That's it? Like, the end? Like, Hannibal Lecter wins, he eats Clarice, <laughs> it's over? That's the book you want to make for kids? It's that I'm creepy. in. I'm so in. I'm in. I'm in. Let's do this. And, and so it was, you know, it was very, very fast. Like, that book, I, I remember doing the sketches, like, like that afternoon. Like but in I, black and white. They were black and yeah. white. Because I thought of Chaz Adams. I thought the only way we can do this is to make it like a Chaz Adams book or an Edward Gorey book or what Tim Burton was doing in, in, in his movies at the time. And, and so I brought in the, uh, I did a, a couple sketches and sent them right back. And then I started doing the art. And um, my editor, uh, Kevin Lewis, a fantastic human, gave me my big break. Uh, I did a lot of books with him. He loved it. And, and this was pretty amazing. I remember we, we're f almost done. So you make a dummy, which is like a handmade version of the book. You sketch out all the pages. You bring it in. You look at it. And then once that's approved, then you start painting all the paintings for the final book. Mm -hmm. Somehow everyone had approved this. Everyone was fine. So I start bringing in all the paintings. And some dude at the top of the food chain at Simon Schuster goes, where's the color? <laughs> I don't know. We, sales is worried. They may not, it might need color. And we're like, no color. Like We can't have color. And so that turned into a big, you know, argument. And then the book you came want. in, and the, and the same dude was like, this is how it ends? <laughs> I don't know if this is, this is how it should end. Can they all take a bow at the end like it was a stage show? And I'm like, no, no. I'm like, this thing was written like 200 years ago. Why are we going to change it? We're not going to change it. So it was amazing to see, though. I got to see firsthand... A, company politics, obviously, in a, in a book like this where there was a lot of people around it, but also kind of standing my ground of like what I believed in and what I thought kids 
would respond to. And, and I thought, it's not, it, I would never terrify a child ever, period. I would never do that. I'll spook them, I'll, I'll, I'll zing them a little, but I would never do anything to, to, to terrify a kid. And I thought, th there is no way this book is worse than what they're watching on TV or what they're playing in a video game. It's completely mild compared to that. Um, so we have to, as I feel as, as, as authors and illustrators and people who make books, books have to rise up to that because video games and movies and stuff like that have changed so much from when mm -hmm. I was this big to this old dude now. You know, I mean, it's really, the video games now are, I can't believe how amazing they are. They are. And, and the movies, and it's just one button, and it's like, pff, you can watch anything you want. And, and that's part of a child's landscape, right? So books have to bring it now. They gotta, they've got to do that because they're now competing with those other mediums. They're not bad mediums, but that's the landscape that we exactly. live in now. Exactly. So, so, so yeah, the spider's going to eat us, the fly. <laughs> before you tell us about your Star Wars adventure, yeah, because I, I know they want to hear this. Before you tell us that, um, just describe your your writing process. I mean, how do, you, how do you tell, how do you write a story? When you're writing the Chronicles. Right, okay? Spider-Wick. This is Spider-Wick Chronicles. Yeah. This is an epic story. Three, yeah. three, five books? Five books. Five books. Yeah. And a field guide. Yep. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And, but do you know when you start the story how the story's going to end? Do do you know what's going to, do you outline it all in your head before you start writing, or does it all kind of come out as you're writing? It's a little bit of both. I'm, I'm definitely a plan. Every writer is different, so every writer is going to give you a different answer. I have these ideas and notions that come to me while I'm sketching, and then at a certain point it tips, and I have to put the drawings to the side and just start writing. So I start writing, writing, and I usually will write an outline okay, you know, Luke Skywalker got up, Luke Skywalker went here, Luke Skywalker did that, you know, Jared mm -hmm. Grace did this, Jared Grace did that, whatever. And then um, sometimes I'll go back and do a little bit of art to help me visualize uh, scenes. But at a certain point, you're in a computer or writing out for days and days and days to get that story figured out. So I do an outline, but you, it's almost like a roadmap. And for me... You have like, okay, if I turn here and turn here and turn here, I'll get to my destination. But, you know, maybe it'd be cool to take a left over here and just see what's over here, just to see. And we'll still get to the destination. So I do a little bit of that. And um, I usually have an ending. Um, for me, stories have to work on a, a physical ending and an emotional ending. They're two different things. There's two different climaxes that have to happen there the catharsis that the character has to feel, and then the actual physical thing that has to be accomplished. Um, Luke Skywalker has to blow up the Death Star, but Luke Skywalker also has to realize he's going to become a knight. Those are two different, you know what I mean? They're two mm -hmm. different things. So when I'm writing my books, I'm thinking of all those things. And most importantly, I'm thinking about my mom reading to me as a kid and getting, what did I draw from Winnie the Pooh? What is she drawing? from Winnie the Pooh. I still go back to that. Really? I always go back to that. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, you wrote a book, uh, the Wandla series. Yeah. And you have a female Protag protagonist. Yes. Female. Of course. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah. All my favorite books had female protagonists. Why? Because all my favorite books had What were your female. favorite books that had female protagonists, for Alice's example? Adventures in Wonderland, uh, Dorothy and the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Ah. I would argue Peter Pan, that Wendy darling, is actually the protagonist of okay. Peter Pan. Some might argue that Peter Pan is the protagonist because, well, he gets top billing in the, in the book. <laughs> but Peter Pan doesn't really change. A protagonist has to, has to go through some kind of growth and yeah. change. Peter Pan doesn't. He's still like cool dude that wears tights and kills pirates at the beginning and doesn't care. And he's a kid. He yeah. doesn't care. And at the end, he's still a cool dude that wears tights and doesn't care at the end. He doesn't change. Wendy changes. Wendy goes through the huge major change. In fact, Wendy's a woman and her daughter leaves. I'm here for your daughter at the end of the, mm -hmm. the end of Peter Pan. So she goes through the change. I loved all that. I didn't care that they were girls when I was a kid. I didn't, I didn't care when I reread them in college. I didn't care now as, as a father. Well, I just wondered if there was some reason why the, the, your, your character was a girl in the book. 
I had always pictured Eva Nine, the protagonist of One La, as a girl. It became solidified when I became a parent, and, and we had a little girl. I was like, I'm wow. writing this. Two things happened. I turned 40, and, and Sophia, my daughter, was born, and I'm like, I'm working on this book. I, I am now on a timer, I feel, where I've got to tell the, the stories that are really deep inside of me, and One La is, is a big piece of my heart on, on paper. And like a four-year project. Right? Five, yeah. Five. It took a while. Yeah. Five year project. Yeah, it took wow. a while to get them all, get all that out of my head. Now, my head felt lighter after. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, where to get the names of your characters? Oh, I'm a big fan of, um, I think this is probably be, read, from the books that I loved as a kid and from films like Star Wars. I love a name that alludes to the character, who the character is. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, Eva's obviously, or Eva is a, is a, is a riff off of Eve, yeah. and, and she's ninth generation, so she's just a number. I mean, that's used oh, in a lot of, okay. that's used in a lot of futuristic, uh, potentially dystopian type stories. Um, Jimmy Zhang Wow, Zhang Wow, like it's, you know, it's the type of character he is. Um, I'm trying to think of the names again. Jared Grace, I mean, Holly, not Grace, he's very graceful. I mean, there's, it, there's a lot of things. Spider Wick, uh, Thimble Tack, so he's, He's a brownie, and when he, brownies are helpful, but mm -hmm. then they can turn into bogarts, which they're not helpful. So thimble and tack, the, you know, those are like the names. So I love that. I'm a big yeah. fan of, of using a name that helps describe. I think because when you grow up with a name like Dieter Lisi, <laughs> you're like, really? That is, a, <laughs> that is a lot of vowels. Wow. There's like 19 letters in that name. There was like a period where I couldn't even spell it, and it's like, when you grow up with it, you're like, oh, I so wish my last name was like Smith or just <laughs> Jones or anything. And no, I, you know, it's, it's this. And so you, you go through school and you're like, you know, every single teacher, they'd be like, you know, mm. uh, 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 Dwayne, <laughs> Decker, Dieter, D, how do you, where are you? Can you <laughs> say that for me? Dieter, I'm just going to call you T-Dog and we're going to keep on moving. <laughs> Especially just, in the South. You just, you just, that's, you know, so you're, you're and you're just like, you know. And after a while, then you're like, yeah, that's my name. I love that name, you know. I got Z's in my name. Who gets that? <laughs> two Z's. Give me two. I'll take two. All right. Then you get the call from Lucas Films. I did. My right. Tell us about this. The, the phone rang, and wow. when you picked it up, it said on the, the caller ID, Lucas Film. That's what it, and it was like, you know. Wow. <laughs> I mean, Can you get up? No. <laughs> it hurts. Um, it all hurts. And they were like, um, they were like, we we this love. This is George Lucas. No, George Lucas didn't call me. No, I know, no, but, but I'm, I mean, his company. This yeah. is his company. Yeah, well, yeah. This is big. <laughs> it was big. It was big. They had actually contacted me before to work on um, Strange Magic, which was a film that came out a couple years ago, oh. or a year ago, maybe last year. And I, I turned it down only because they wanted me to move out there. And, and it would have been amazing to work directly with, with, with George. But I was kind of like, you want 20-year-old Tony, and I'm older Tony, and I, I'm going to keep making my books. How's that for a test? Wow. That's like, that's like the clouds parting and that bearded dude in a flannel. I'm George Lucas. You. <laughs> you, little kid. Me? <laughs> Come to, I just couldn't do it. I, I felt like I was... It was one of those tests you get in your life. You get a test, and, you, and I, I, hopefully I passed it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, the movie bombed. I think I did pass it. Um, <laughs> sorry, George. <laughs> so go back to this book. So, then, so they were like, we know you're a, a huge Star Wars fan. How did they know that? It's a Lucas film. They know everything. It really? <laughs> no, they know <laughs> that you're not a Star Wars fan, Samia. Yeah. So, no, no I actually, I was. I was. So you've Empire never seen Strikes any? Back. I you've saw seen, all you've seen them? I saw all those. Okay, what's your favorite one? First one. Really? <laughs> Who's your favorite character? R2-D2. R2-D2? I loved R2-D2. Really? Yeah, I just love I the name. I love the name. You I would have pinned you as like a Han Solo type of gal. No, no? R2-D2. Princess Leia. Too fast, too scoundrelly <laughs> for, you, for you? Okay. okay. And who is the big guy? Um, Chewbacca? Chewbacca. What Chewbacca. a great name that is, Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Loved it. You like Chewbacca? Yeah. Like, he's like he was in the heavy metal. It's like, oh, like, 
can tell he's like. <laughs> so how did they know about you, sir? No, so they knew about me. Um, they knew I was a huge star. I've used a lot of times when I go into <laughs> when I've gone into schools to talk story and and process a lot of times. And I, I've done a little bit tonight. Just I use Star Wars as shorthand because every it's a common thing. Everyone understands what you're talking about when you're talking when you're deconstructing story. For me, Star Wars is so easy, especially if I'm talking to like a nine or a ten year old about a character changing and going through a catharsis or archetypes, I can use Star Wars and they get it like right away. I can go, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a mentor. He helps Luke, just like Gandalf, just like Dumbledore, and their heads go, Pfft, uh. right? They, they, then all of a sudden, like all these connections happen and they get it. And, and so, um, so the folks at Lucasfilm knew I had been, I'd been doing that. And they were like, we, we would love for you to tell the, the original Star Wars movies as a book for young readers using um, the artwork of Ralph McQuarrie. And Ralph was, Ralph was the uh, artist that George hired at the beginning, like in the mid-70s, to start visualizing what Star Wars would look like. So this, this is a point when Star Wars is, is literally just words and pictures. There's no models. There's no one cast. It's just George writing and Ralph painting these paintings and also designing what would become Darth Vader and, and Chewbacca and all these other characters. And I was absolutely flattered and honored to be asked to, to do that. Who gets to do that? Really? really? That's, that's, that's so cool. And when did this book, when was the book published? Came out uh, last fall. Okay, yeah. so we're along with the movie, the, the movie's Kind of ramping up for the ramping up for the yeah. new movie, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, all right. yeah. So, so obviously you felt amazing when, I mean. Well, I, <laughs> was there like any pressure, like, I don't know if I want to do this? <laughs> no. Okay. No, no. No, I was like, All right, whatever you need. Here, this is my daughter. Her name is Sophia. She's, <laughs> as far as I know, she's not uh, any, any glucose or, or gluten. She's good. She's good. This is my house. No. Um, I, I, I remember asking him, I'm like, could I maybe come out and see Ralph's art? Could I, could I come and visit you guys in San Francisco and just maybe, you know, just I'll get inspired if I look at his art because, you know, the the nine million JPEGs you sent me just aren't enough. Can I? And they're like, oh, yeah, come on out. And I was like, really? Oh, cool. So I came out. I, they had a couple other uh, authors coming out that were working on other books. And they're like, we're going to take you to, um, we're going to take you to the, um, the archive where, where the art is kept. And I'm thinking I'm going to go in an art room and there's going to be a bunch of flat files and we're going to look at art. No, it was George's archive. So we go to the archive. And as soon as we walk in, there's the Death Star. There's Indiana Jones outfit. There's R2-D2. There's the dude from Willow. There's the, like everything. I didn't look at any of his art. I walked <laughs> up to the props, and I thought, and I'm like, can we take pictures? They're like, I don't think you can. I'm like, okay, I am just going to start touching stuff until you tell me to stop <laughs> touching stuff. <laughs> oh, look, there's our 2 d Oh, look, there's the Death Star. Oh, look, at it, it's so, it's so, okay, I'm just going to keep on touching. It was, it was amazing. It was just a, a, a little warehouse with, with a bunch of, um, a bunch of shelves you'd get at like Home Depot. That was the thing that was, I thought it was all gonna be like under glass and stuff and it was just shelves and all the stuff was just sitting on, just sitting loose. Like, oh look, an X-Wing fighter, look at that. <laughs> look at that, that's gonna fit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and then I read. Yada, 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 yeah, I ended yeah, up in jail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. It's a callback. It's a, and then I read that you actually, we had, you had a number of collaborations along the way, a number of books that were, yeah, that well, you collaborated Spider with. Spiderwick, I worked right? with uh, Holly Black. Right. Yep, yep. And you know what's interesting about that is that neither of you are given credit for being authors or illustrators. It's uh, like you were both the authors. Yeah. And both the, so how did that work? Well, uh, truth be told, Spiderwick came out, came about from um, a summer in Florida uh, it was, I was in middle school and it was really hot. I don't remember what. Oh, I was like probably, all the time. Yeah, like all the time. <laughs> we had, we did not have like central air. We had like one air conditioning unit that just was like, right? And it was, it was so hot. And I remember, you know, imagine, you know, house with three kids, it's hot out. We're just torturing mom. We're just, you know. And I was like, my mom's like, you need to go outside and play. And I was like, I don't want to go outside. <laughs> and she was like, just get out of my, get out of my hair. Just go in your room and do something. I don't care. So I went in my room and I had, I had uh, the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. I had 
Brian Froud's and Alan Lee's book called Fairies, um, I had uh, field guides to uh, insects and spiders and, and fish and birds of South Florida. And I, I thought, I, and I had an empty notebook from school. And I started drawing my version of a dragon. And then I started copying the language out of a field guide and transposing it into describing a dragon. And then the next day I did a troll. And then the next day I did another creature. And a lot of creatures I made up. And then a lot of creatures were out of folklore. And I, by the end of the summer, I filled this notebook. Wow. Thing. I did that. I did that notebook. I remember that. I, there was something cool about it. And, and I, at some point, I, I went back to it in the 90s. I, when I was working for, for Dungeons & Dragons, I ended up working for the company that made Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> and um, <laughs> King Nerd. Um, I know when I say that. <laughs> And I, um, I, I, I revisited it. I found it, and I revisited it, and I thought about um, making this, this field guide to, that was very scientifically minded about dragons. And then I started developing what would become Arthur Spiderwick. And I presented it to the company that published them at Dun, uh, Dungeons & Dragons. They didn't know what to do with it. They're like, this is really cool, but we don't, we don't know what to do with this. It's not really our type of thing that we publish, suckers. Um, <laughs> So when The Spider and the Fly, which was my third picture book, uh, it, it, it came out, we really, you really don't know, I mean, I look at all these books that I've, that I've made, you don't know what a book is going to do. When you make it, you, I put everything I've got into every book, I really do, but you don't know at the end of the day if the book's going to sell, if it's going to bomb, you just, you just don't know. You just you give it everything you got, and you know at the end of the day you did the best job you could, and, you, and that helps me when it bombs. So, um, so Spider and the Fly, we thought for sure no one is going to buy it. It's going to be like the three goths that went that drew in high school. They're the ones that are going to they're going to buy this book, and no one else is going to buy it. And as soon as it came out, it went right on the Times list, and and then there was a lot of talk about it possibly being a contender for the Caldecott. And uh, and I was a little bit like la la la, I don't want to know because I, I didn't want to set myself up for for disappointment. And um, and it and it and it won and. I, I'll never forget this. Uh, my editor said, we'll make any type of book you want to make. What do you want to make? Mm -hmm. You don't get that yeah. very often in life. And I, and I had a lot of books that I was thinking about that I'd been kind of playing around with. And I, I stopped for a second. It was enough to like kind of rattle me. Like I, I think I was just going to be like this working, working class, working illustrator, just always kind of... And then I just thought back like, what... What does this kid want? What does the little kid Tony, what does 10-year-old Tony want that old Tony can, can make now, right? You think about that. Like, what's the thing you wished existed? And now I'm being given an opportunity to make that thing. And I, I remembered that notebook that I had made when I was like 12. And I, and I, and I, I uh, started redrawing all the things. I had elaborated on it. And, I, and I, uh, I pitched it to them, and they were like, and we had gotten a gal from Scholastic who had just launched Harry Potter, and she's like, that, we're doing that. That's going to be huge. Wow. And you're like, no. So it, I, it got to a point where I couldn't do all of it, and Holly had been helping. Uh, Angela, my wife, had helped her get her first young adult novel uh, published, and, and she was helping me do all the research, all the folklore research, to make all the folklore actual in the, in the book. So the folklore oh, okay. is all drawn from real folklore. And I thought, and Holly and I were getting along terrifically while we were working. I thought, Holly could help me write these books. And, and so we sat down, and Holly and I would have a conversation, not unlike what you and I are having. And she, you know, we'd both be writing furiously. At the end of the day, Holly would actually go and write it. And then I would do, but I would show her the art, and she would give me comments. And that's not how books are, are normally made. Right. It's usually an, on, a writer gets an idea. They go and they write it 100 times over and over until they get it right. And then the editor goes find finds the artist. And, um, oh. and, a, and a lot of times the uh, illustrator doesn't even meet the author until after the fact. And here it was constantly back and forth, back and forth. Our roles were so blurred that we were like, how could we assign a credit of written by, because it was never made that way. We just wanted to do whatever we could to make the best book possible. What could we do to make it the best? And when we went back and looked at it, we were like, there's no way. How do you give credit? Like there is, everybody did everything. And so that's why 
Both names are on there. Both names are on there, yeah. and and um, you know, and that's how it, that's so how then, it went down. So then, you go, you're beyond Holly. Then you start collaborating with your six-year-old <laughs> on a project that for a donation that you gave to oh, the Starlight you're the, you're, Foundation. Oh, I did my homework. You did. You yeah. did. You're talking so about the tell, Lorax painting. Yeah. Uh huh. Tell us about that. Well, reading, it's for Reading is Fundamental is what I did it for. It was right. actually for Reading is Fundamental does... Oh, um, you're right. I'm sorry. They do chair. It's okay. It's good. I'm still impressed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading is Fundamental does uh, charity events to, to help support that organization, which is a, obviously an organization I, I believe a lot in. Uh, they do great work, um, especially getting books into places where kids don't have any books. They're all about making sure that that happens. And... Um, I, they had hit me up one year, they were, they, they'd been picking themes for their galas, their fundraising galas, and one year they did uh, Maury Sendak. It was the theme is Maury Sendak. I think it was like the year after he had passed away, a couple years after, and I did a pick, I wanted to, they just asked me for art. Can you donate a piece of art and we'll, and we'll auction it? And I thought, no, 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 it's Maury Sendak. I'm going to do a piece of art for you guys, right? So I, I did this piece of, of Maurice as a wild thing. And then they asked me again a couple years later, they're like, well, we're doing a Dr. Seuss one. So... I went up into my daughter's room, and, and we went through some of the Dr. Seuss books, and I picked Lorax. Oh, I love that book, Dad. I know I love this book, too. <laughs> and I was like, so I came down. And, and she's I, six, right? She's, at this point, yeah, she's yeah, probably like she's six. six. So I start working on it, right? And, and my daughter's very precocious, but she's very active. She's, she's a little different. She's wired a little different than I was. So she, a lot of times she's running around in the yard, but she'll come into the studio and kind of, well, what are you working on? And then she'll go, okay, I'm going to go play. But this time she came in, and she kind of, she stayed. And I noticed she was like really looking at the drawings of the Lorax I was doing. And I said, you, you like what I'm doing? And she's like, yeah, I like, I like what you're doing with the thing. I'm like, and then she kind of asked for a piece of paper. Can I, can I, can I draw? I want to draw a Lorax too. And I said, you want to just help dad draw this Lorax? So <laughs> it was terrifying. I got to be honest with you. So I'm like, I'm going to draw the Lorax and you're going to draw the truffula trees. And I'm going to paint the Lorax, and you're going to paint the Truffula trees, right? So, so I, we did it, and we practiced, and I showed her, and then I, I inked this painting that we're now going to put in auction that we're hoping to make a lot of money on, and then I hand the pen to my six-year-old <laughs> and go, go to town. But it was, you know, it was awesome. It was awesome. And at the end, what I wanted to show her was, like, this is a thing I love to do, and we're going to do this thing and we're going to turn it into books for kids who don't have books. Like, I'm like, do you understand like, how this is a thing daddy can do that helps in a way. He's taking the thing that he knows how to do really well. I can't drive around in a van and give books to those kids, but I can do this, and it will allow people to go do that. And I, I really, we talked about it a lot. I think she really grasped the concept of, of, of doing something, taking your, the thing that you do and, and turning it into something else. That's a lesson that I started to really um, grasp probably in the last, since she's been alive, really in the last five to, six, five to seven years. Um, she, she suffered from really horrible seizures when she was young, and uh, we spent a lot of time in the hospitals. And there was a lot of scared, if you've ever been in a children's hospital, it is, it is yeah. one of the worst feelings you can ever ha hope to have or not hope to have, but ever experience. And, um, and you get to know the other parents. We were there for like a week. And you get to know the other parents. Everyone's going through a really rough, rough time. The kids know the parents are scared and they're anxious. You can feel it's palpable. And we read. We read a lot. That helped us. That was like a routine for us that helped us. And I got out of the hospital. We got out of the hospital finally. And I said, I'm going to start doing my book events that I do at schools and bookstores. I'm going to start doing them in hospitals for kids. Oh. Wow, so have you done that? Every tour. Great. That's why, that's the Starlight Foundation, uh, that's when I became oh, that's involved right. with them okay. and they do that. But I've done, I did Bellevue, and, um, and that was pretty, um, um, it was very moving. And um, we did, um, I, 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 I'm telling you guys this only to share the, use it as an example, it's not something I like to talk about, but I organized a group of guys and we all went to, um, to Sandy Hook right after the Sandy Hook uh, tragedy because wow. I knew what we could do. And uh, I feel like we did, we did some good um, in, in just sharing. You, you don't, 
I think when you're at home or in your studio and you're making these books and you're living in your mind and you're trying to impress this, this 10-year-old version of yourself, you, don't, you sometimes forget that that can mean the world to a, a reader and that, that lives by like Wimpy Kid or loves living in the world of Harry Potter or loves you know, Percy Jackson. And so um, I just, you, you, I, do, I don't even to this day really fully grasp how, how powerful that can, that can be. Um, but all I know is it, whatever I can do, if it helps um, a, a little person and their family and make, them, make life a little easier, I'll, I'll do whatever I can. Being yeah. a parent is a powerful thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It, it is. is. You know, it. We were supposed to stop and have, have, see if you all have any questions, but it's getting late. Oh, we can't. Um, it's too much of a downer. We got to have at least one more. Like to bring we, it up. Can we? Can we? Can we? Does anyone have a question? Yes, Barbara. Um, I thought it was Sammy. We know each other quite well. Loud, Barbara. And I, <laughs> and I just retired after 37 years in Montana. Congratulations. Yeah. And allow them to either do uh, military or community service, whatever. Yeah. Do you think we're pushing our kids too much, especially now, we're letting them go in their soft year of high school to college? Do you think we're pushing them too much? They should explore themselves first, or what? Yeah. I mean, how many of us knew who we who we were when we were seventeen years old? Can I mean. Can you the question so we can hear? Oh yeah. She uh, her question was about in Europe. Uh, the, the school, the, the society and the school st is structured in such a way that it's, it's, it's very much uh, accepted that a high school graduate can take a year off before they begin college. And so her question was, are we pushing uh, our students and our children too fast, forcing them into college right away? Uh, because we're programmed, right? That's kind of how we're programmed. I mean, I can only speak from what my experience is, so I don't know if it's the right thing. It's just what I experienced that even though I could draw, I was not ready yet. And, I, and I, just because you can draw, that doesn't mean you know who you are. I mean, I still didn't know who I really was. And I still don't know if I know who I am. I, th I mean, how many of us really know what we wanted? How many went to college and got the four-year degree and then finished and were like, forget that. I'm going to go be this because that's oh, my yeah. calling. That's what I really want to be. You know, I, I feel like a lot of my friends got their four-year degree because it, they felt like it was going to make their parents proud, that it was going to make them happy, that they weren't failures. But then they got out of school and were like, but that's not what I, I want to do. Um, I, you know, I, for me, I, I, just, I think you have to follow your path. And I think as a parent, you have to encourage that path, even if it seems unrealistic, but temper it with some footholds of reality along the way, perhaps, to get to that path. I've always pictured my career as, as a person that's either in a bog and you're just dropping one stone in front of the other, or I'm building a staircase and I'm, and I'm making a staircase. You can't jump to the end. You have to, you have to do it in little, little steps. And, and sometimes you're going to fall off that path. And I, and, and I think that um, when it comes to college, if you don't know who you are, what you want to do. Maybe that does require a road trip across the country. Maybe that does require going to another part of the world and turning around and looking back at the United States as opposed to looking out. See how other people live. See how the rest of the world is. That's how you learn to appreciate the things you have and maybe um, understand the things you don't have. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other? Yes, we have a question in the back. Uh, yeah. Loud, please. You said you went to uh, Lucasfilm and saw their archives. Did you ever get to see any um, original Drew Struzan work? Um, Drew Struzan, who was the uh, poster artist who worked on many of the Star Wars film posters, uh, uh, fantastic talent. I didn't see any of his um, original work there. That's not to say there wasn't. George is a massive uh, art collector with incredible taste, especially for illustrations. So there were original Rockwells, 
um, Maxfield Parrish's, I think Daybreak I saw. I think he has Daybreak. That's a pretty famous Maxfield Parrish painting. And it's actually not, not that big. Um, I'm sure he has Drew's stuff squirreled away somewhere. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, he's such an amazing art collector. He's working on trying to open a museum to showcase a lot of his, his art. And I'm, I, would, I would bet money that Drew Struzan's work will be there. Any, any budding writers in the audience of you young people? Artists. Artists, OK, great. You pick. Art, another artist. You pick. Yes. Actually, my question is, what is, what is you know, your, your best advice for um, new authors and, and Good people, question. You know, whether we have something coming out or we're just getting started? What, what is your best advice that you've learned in your journey? Let, let me repeat that so you all can hear it. What she was asking about what is his best advice for a new or a, a, a writer who's just starting out. An up and coming writer. Um, you just, um, you have to be tenacious. You have to, like, you really have to just keep, keep at it. You have to, um, you have to have a bit of a thick skin, obviously. Um, you're making a thing that's meant to be consumed by others. You, you're, you make your living by other people consuming it, right? I mean, that's how I make my living by, when you buy a book, a certain percentage of that money goes to me. That's how I make, that's how I make my living. Um, so you have to, um, for me, it's been, it's been, I'm, I'm constantly making, I'm constantly creating because I love it. It's my, it's my, my passion. Um, and I think, re uh, reaching out, you, you have to be able to go into a school and talk to, uh, students if you're up for that. You have to go to a bookstore and, and, and talk. The, definitely in my early part of my, uh, career as a, as a children's book, author and illustrator, I, I visited a lot of schools, and a lot of them were fantastic, and a lot of them were horrible. But you just, because there's always like one kid in the audience, though, that's like really into what you do, and you, and you just keep going. Um, and you, and you, you know, if you love what you do, um, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll give back to you. And unless you have something more specific, if you're like, but specifically I want to know about Amazon reviews or something like <laughs> Don't read those. Don't read your. I know, you know, through the process, you know, they, they make suggestions or they say, well, you, maybe you should write it this way. Uh huh. No, you should write it this way. It goes from maybe, you know, a suggestion to a real firm push. Have you ever conformed on any of these or have you stuck to your guns and told my story? Did you I, all hear that? Oh, yeah. She wants to know if I conform to any kind of editorial suggestions. A good editor actually won't tell you what they think you should write, mm -hmm. they'll only ask you questions that hopefully will stimulate you into solving them. I have what I call beta readers, which are like beta testers for video games. My beta readers we've had, I've had for years. Uh, Steve was on Spiderwick from the beginning, before Spiderwick became huge, and was probably a, even harder on us when Spiderwick became big, which I thought, this guy is like the real deal. And, and Steve will, will take me to task on, on everything. You have to surround yourself with, with readers, a readers group that, that you respect and appreciate what they say, especially if two of the three ping you on the same thing, then you know you're, you're not being clear about what you're trying to express or, or say. Um, though my reader group, I get more out of that than my editor. My editor's more like, um, this is great, they may make a few suggestions, but they're not gonna be like, you know, I, you, you, you know let me help you f like with the, like, the scene, like they're, they're not gonna, my editors at least in my experience have not been, unless I've at, pointedly asked them, they're not gonna tell me what they think I should put in the book. They'll just suggest like, hey, what if, you know, if you're not feeling the climax enough, what if this happened? What if that happened? You figure it out, you know? For those of you who don't know, Tony does have a YouTube channel, <laughs> which I found, and he has a Facebook page and th I think that would be a wonderful opportunity for any of, any of you who are interested in any of this kind of work or still have questions. I'm sure you'd answer them, correct? I'll do my best. There, there you go. Tom? Um, same question. Uh, Star Wars came out last fall. What's, what's next for you? Uh, um, I don't know if the cover's up here. It might be out in the, uh, in the lobby. Um, I... I got my start doing art for Dungeons and Dragons right when I came out of art school. I learned a lot. I didn't really touch on much of that tonight, but 
that's really where I learned how to do world building because Dungeons and Dragons, those types of games are so much about building an entire world, not just characters. So all that art from, my from the 90s before I did kids' books is being collected into a book called Realms, which will be out next month. Um, Congratulations. I have one copy. I brought it with me. Uh, if you Feel free to come by and flip through it and take a look at it. And then I just uh, completed art for a book with um, Mo Willems, who's a pretty known children's book author. And um, it's about a dog and a cat who live in Paris. Mo just got back from living in Paris for a year and asked me to, uh, to illustrate a book with him, which I was absolutely flattered. And that'll be out um, later this year. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you all guys. for coming. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you so much.